Tashi DeLay, and welcome to Tibet Talks. I'm Ashwin Verghese, Communications Officer of the International Campaign for Tibet. With the world facing a historic crisis, we at ICT want to help spread the wisdom of Tibetan culture, as well as the teachings of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. In this series, you'll hear live conversations about Tibet with inspiring thinkers, leaders, activists, and artists. On today's episode, we're going to talk all about advocacy for Tibet and how you can help make a difference for the Tibetan people. As you might know, ICT is a membership-based advocacy organization. With our thousands of members across the country and around the world, we advocate for laws and policies to help the people of Tibet. Joining us today to discuss these efforts are two perfect speakers. First up, he's the president of the International Campaign for Tibet, and he's a former member of parliament from Italy. Please join me in welcoming Matteo Makachi. Matteo, how are you? Hello, Ashri. I'm fine, thank you. Well, it's great to have you back on Tibet Talks for our second episode. Our second guest today is the vice president of ICT. He's also a former member of the Central Tibetan Administration the Office of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and the Office of Tibet in Switzerland. Please join me as I welcome Bucheng Sering. Bucheng La, Tashi Dele. Tashi Dele, Ashwin. Great to have you both here. So we'll get to the conversation in just a moment, but first, one housekeeping note for our audience. If you're watching this live and would like to ask questions uh, for Matteo or Bucheng, please email your questions to comments at savetibet.org or post your questions in the comment section of the live stream on our Facebook page. With that, we'll get the conversation started. So Matteo, there is obviously a lot going on with the coronavirus right now, and Congress is preoccupied with dealing with the pandemic. At the same time, China's repression of the Tibetan people has not stopped. It has continued unabated. In this atmosphere, what is ICT doing to make sure that Tibet stays on Congress's agenda? Yes, hi Ashwin. Uh, so I think this is a very uh, topical uh, issue for our, all our viewers today. And I want to start uh, by reminding that, you know, ICT has been involved uh, on advocacy for a, for a very long time. Uh, the organization was founded over 30 years ago now, and uh, the advocacy work has always been at the center of our agenda. Now, uh, during the last period, I think, uh, the, during the last you know, few years, we have been focusing on new legislation, and in particular on the need to make sure that you know, U.S. policy on Tibet is strengthened and that the administration is focused. Uh, these days, we actually, right before uh, the beginning of the uh, crisis uh, caused by the pandemic, at the beginning of March, we held a very important strategy meeting in Washington, D.C. Uh, these meetings have been going on for now six years, and these are meetings that uh, uh, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, has been convening with ICT and other like-minded you know, friends, members of Congress, and other groups who are supportive. Uh, the reason for this is because we need to make sure that there is, uh, you know, um, attention and focus uh, when it comes to the uh, issues that we want the Congress to be able to put forward uh, uh, on the U.S. Congress agenda. And at that meeting, uh, it was very uh, clear that we needed to continue to uh, push for making sure that our new piece of legislation, which is currently being discussed in Congress, the Tibetan Policy and Support Act, could move forward. Uh, this legislation was uh, introduced last year, and it was introduced after following another strategy meeting that was convened by Speaker Pelosi, where there was a decision to try to make sure that the question of religious freedom and the uh, preservation of Tibetan Buddhism, as it has been for many centuries, with at the center the role and the figure of the Dalai Lama could be protected. And in order to do that, uh, we push and we work with members of Congress to make sure that there could be new legislation that would make sure and would affirm as part of U.S. law that it's only up to Tibetan Buddhists to determine 
who the future Dalai Lamas will be. And so this legislation was introduced by Jim McGovern in the House and Senator Rubio, Senator Marco Rubio in, in the Senate, both a Democrat and a Republican. And it was passed uh, just a few months ago at the end of January by the House of Representatives. So in March, we discussed how to move forward. And actually, we were going to make sure that we were going to have today, uh, you know, the opportunity to celebrate a, a big step forward. And actually, this is now being uh, postponed because the Senate Foreign Relations Committee had put uh, the Tibetan Policy and Support Act on the agenda for today's discussion. But last night, uh, there was a decision to postpone the meeting, not for reasons related to the uh, Tibetan Policy and Support Act, but because uh, there were disagreements between the majority and the minority on some of these issues. So um, our focus uh, at this point, I think it's, uh, it's, you know, it's making sure that you know, these legislations move forward, but also it, it comes into the larger context of the overall conversation around US and China relations. And I think now with the coronavirus epidemic, many people have realized that what happens in China doesn't stay only in China. What happens in China has an effect on the world. And I think the Tibetan people have been at the forefront of this for over 60 years, uh, you know, suffering from the authoritarian rule that China has imposed there. But actually, as China's role grows in the world, it's very clear that its influence and its methods are expanding to other places. And we see in many in many respects. But with the coronavirus epidemic, I think the lack of transparency, lack of rule of law, censorship, and actions taken by the Chinese government are waking up many people in the world that you know something systematic needs to change into China to make sure uh, that there is a better future for all. So we think that you know, uh, promoting uh, action on Tibet uh, promotes change in China and better rule for Tibetans would be better role for China and in the end, for the world. So this is what we have been doing over the last uh, you know, few months during the pandemic. All right, thank you for that, Matteo. I think that really kind of helps put this issue into context. So I appreciate that. You mentioned the Tibetan Policy and Support Act in your answer, and the TPSA would do a lot to help the Tibetan people. Utangla, you are a native of Tibet, and you're also one of thousands of Tibetan Americans in this country. So can you tell us, from your perspective as a member of the Tibetan community, what does the TPSA mean? Basically, uh, any le uh, legislation passed by the United States Congress or being discussed by the United States Congress has an impact on Tibet if it concerns the Tibetan people, and thereby that would itself be uh, something of interest to the Tibetan American community. But specifically, the Tibetan Policy and Support Act, there are three components that are very much in the uh, uh, thinking of the Tibetan Americans and other uh, Tibet supporters, I should even say that. You know. First is this bill promotes the American position of uh, preserving and protecting Tibetan people, distinct uh, religious, cultural, and identity. And within that is expansion of uh, the concept of uh, promoting dialogue. TPSA, for example, now uh, mandates that the special coordinator should form a sort of a coalition of uh, uh, allied countries to do something on Tibet. Also, on the issue of the, uh, the Tibetan Buddhist, Buddhism and religious freedom, the issue of the Dalai Lama's reincarnation is something that's very much uh, uh, pertinent and of a concern to the Tibetan American community. Uh, the second aspect of this is the programmatic uh, support that uh, the TPSA has formalized. That is both for Tibetans in Tibet and Tibetans in diaspora. Every year, the Congress uh, appropriates several million um, dollars to help the Tibetan people in their effort to preserve and promote their culture and identity and way of life. And that also is of interest to the Tibetan American community. Thirdly, as we have uh, uh, been hinting here uh, all along, uh, since 1990, the Tibetan Americans as a community have come up very much out there on the radar of American political uh, system. So much so that when the previous legislation, the Reciprocal Access to Tibet was uh, passed, 
the then uh, co-sponsor or the main uh, initiator of that legislation, Congressman uh, Jim McGovern, when he introduced the legislation in, up in Massachusetts, he specifically invited Tibetan Americans to say and told them that it was because of you all that I'm introducing this legislation today. So the TPSA represents the aspirations of the Tibetan American community as part of the broader American community. Thank you, Buchung. It is always extremely valuable to hear from somebody in the Tibetan community about how the work we do here at ICT impacts them. At the same time, we know that ICT has many non-Tibetan members as well, and no doubt there are many non-Tibetans watching this conversation right now. So, Mateo, can you tell us, for people who are not members of the Tibetan community, why should what happens in Tibet matter to them? Well, I can... I can speak for myself, you know, to begin with, because uh, um, I got involved early in my life on human rights issues and, you know, working in Italy actually to promote uh, civil rights and democratic freedoms in my own country and uh, having, uh, you know, um, some kind of appeal for, you know, what was also happening to other people. I started to get involved also more internationally. And, you know, the Tibetan issue was one of the first that I learned about. And actually, I learned by meeting some Tibetan monks in Florence in a square uh, who gave me a leaflet, you know, with some information about, you know, the situation and the repression of religious freedom in Tibet. So that made, uh, made an impact for me. And, and I believe, frankly, as a, as a citizen, uh, of my country, but you know, frankly, we are all citizens of the world. And I think, you know, he's always the Dalai Lama reminds us all the time how we are all part of, you know, humanity. That we are, you know, seven million billion human beings. Uh, we are, you know, all the same, and we have the same aspirations. I think there is, you know, general idea that we need to care, take care of each other, and people, other people who are suffering. So that's one, you know, I would say my personal reason, and I think it's shared by many of our members and many people who are maybe viewing um, today. But uh, more in general, I would say that, uh, you, know, what mat you know, what happens in Tibet uh, clearly and what happens in China clearly matters more uh, day by day, you know, for the entire world. I mentioned, you know, uh, the situation about the, you know, the pandemic, but if you look also at, you know, China's rise uh, at the economic level, in the world and its impact on globalization and uh, you know the fact that china is not opening its own market you know to many areas of you know foreign uh, products let's talk about services let's talk about you know freedom of information it's also posing a challenge to the sustainability of a global economic model where china rises on the world becomes more powerful but doesn't abide by the rule and the problem with china has always been that you know they do not do, do not only respect do not respect you know democratic freedoms or rule of law or religious freedom they also do not abide to the you know so many of the basic rules of international trade or if you want to talk about you know domestic you know chinese issues even labor laws and labor rights so there is a big uh, big interest for everybody in the world to see china moving into the right direction and caring about tibet i think offers unique opportunities because uh, i have known uh, the tibetan people and the tibetan movement uh, but i've worked also with other groups and i can say that what i have seen in the tibetan movement is something unique um, the tibetan people in exile have been able to set up a system of democratic governance which is not comparable to any other populations any other refugee community they have done so naturally thank you to the leadership and the vision of his Holiness the dalai lama who early on in his uh, arrival as a refugee in india decided immediately to set up a government in exile and then you know build the schools build the institutions and communities that can sustain the work uh, for Tibetans outside of Tibet, but always with the vision of trying to do something for the Tibetan people inside. Um, so that is one, one, one element. You, you really have partners if you get involved in the Tibetan issue with whom you can work with. But beyond that, I think, and we have shown this uh, with the, our two pieces of legislation that we have, been, we, are, we have been pushing, and one that passed at the end of 2018, the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act. That bill, for the first time, address the issue of Tibet, not only from the point of view of the Tibetan people and the rights being deprived, the fact that there's no access to Tibet and so Tibetans have no right, for example, to interact with, uh, with the others in the world, 
but the main perspective is uh, the perspective of American citizens who are discriminated by China when it comes to access to Tibet, while Chinese citizens can come to the United States and they can go wherever they want, when, you know, when they have a visa, they can be journalists, they can be diplomats, they can be politicians. For Americans, that's not true. When it comes to Tibet, there has been for decades a blockade uh, and discrimination imposed on them so that they cannot have free access to Tibet. So that's one element. So if you care about Tibetan culture, if you are a Tibetan Buddhist, China does not allow you, allow you to go to Lhasa freely, to visit those you know, religious places. Or even if you are not a religious person, if you want to visit Tibet, you are not allowed to do that. Uh, but also with the new legislation, the Tibetan Policy and Support Act, this is very important for Tibetan Buddhists, or all Buddhists, I would say, but in particular for Tibetan Buddhists. Uh, and I know that there are many of our members who are Tibetan Buddhists. What China is trying to do in Tibet with the total control of the religious and the spiritual system, and in particular on the issue of the identification of uh, Tibetan, um, Tibetan Haim Lamas, is going to have an impact on the future of the Tibetan Buddhist lineages because they want to control who the next Dalai Lama would be. They have already appointed their own Panchen Lama and kidnapped the previous one. And so they want to break those lineages and, uh, you know, frankly, undermine religious freedom for everybody in the world. So these are some of the reasons, you know, there are more geopolitical aspects to this, but I think we can stop here for the time being and maybe we have more questions moving forward. Sure, absolutely. And uh, thank you for that answer, Matteo. Uh, I know for people like you and me who are not Tibetan, uh, we feel grateful, honestly, to be exposed to this beautiful culture and to have the opportunity to serve the vision of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. So uh, that's a great opportunity for us. Uh, Butch, I'm going to bring you back in the conversation here. So Matteo touched on this a little bit, but we would be remiss if we didn't mention the significance of today's date. On this day in 1995, His Holiness the Dalai Lama recognized a six-year-old boy in Tibet as the 11th Panchen Lama. Unfortunately, that selection led to the Chinese government committing one of the most brazen violations of religious freedom that we have seen in the modern world. Bucham, that was 25 years ago. As we look back on this important anniversary, can you tell us what happened to the Panchen Lama and what his fate means for the succession of the Dalai Lama. Yes, to understand this, we have to go back to pre-1959 Tibet, when historically, uh, among Tibetan Buddhist leaders, the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama were the most well-known uh, figures uh, of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, the Dalai Lama wielded both the political and the spiritual leader, uh, leadership, but the Panchen Lama mainly spiritual uh, uh, for his congregation. Nevertheless, his interaction with uh, British India, his inter interaction with China, etc., made him a, a well-known figure uh, then. Uh, in 1959, after the Dalai Lama escaped from Tibet to India, the Panchen Lama, the then Panchen Lama, 10th Panchen Lama, uh, remained in Tibet and worked under the Chinese system. He was initially scorned by the Tibetan people. He was initially scorned even by the Chinese and the, he was in prison for many years. Eventually, uh, after his release in the late 70s and in the 80s, he began to symbolize Tibetan people's aspirations within the Chinese system. So much so that when he passed away in 1989, Tibetans, no matter whether you agreed with him or not, uh, uh, lamented his demands because he was the only Tibetan within the Chinese system who really could uh, stand up to the Chinese government uh, and their misrule over Tibet. So in 1989, uh, there are people who sort of uh, feel that, he, that the Panchen Lama did not die but was murdered. Uh, nevertheless, he passed away in 1989. And as per Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the Dalai Lama looked for his reincarnation because historically, again, there is this involvement between uh, the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama on the reincarnation of each other. And so uh, the Chinese uh, government initially allowed the authorities of the Panchen Lama's ministry in Tibet to be uh, indirectly involved with the Dalai Lama. Later on, the Chinese government did not respond to any of the, the Dalai Lama's initiatives. There's a very detailed book if people are interested on that aspect of the issue. Uh, thereafter, when in 1995, the Dalai Lama made his announcement on this day, 
about the reincarnation of the Panchen Lama, the Chinese government, rather than respecting Tibetan religion and culture, uh, three days later on May 17, uh, detained the Panchen Lama, the 11th Panchen Lama, who has not been seen since uh, uh, then. So uh, to put that in perspective, these days we're talking about, uh, particularly the teenagers in the United States and uh, throughout the world, for example, are talking about not being able to go out to freely because for the past uh, two, three months, we've been uh, uh, sheltering place in our homes because of the coronavirus. But in, if you put that in context with the case of Pencha Lama, he may not have seen daylight for the past 25 years. And what does it mean for uh, uh, the issue of uh, the Panchen Lama institution issue of Tibetan Buddhism. And that's why I think uh, uh, this day uh, symbolizes, at least for me, uh, Tibetan uh, subjugation by the Chinese in a nutshell. Thank you for that, uh, Bu Chung. Yeah, it, uh, it continues to remain shocking to me that the Chinese government simply kidnapped a little boy 25 years ago and has not allowed him to see the light of day since then. It's a uh, continuing shock and a real disgrace to the uh, international community. So thank you for talking about that. And like I said, this is an important anniversary, I know, for members of the Tibetan community and for ICT members. And so we just want to acknowledge that. And uh, we continue to call and hope for the release of the Panchen Lama. And we hope that he'll be able to return to his people and take up his position as a religious leader. Uh, Luchan, sorry, can you start? I had your mic off for a second. Can you oh, start that over? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, 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 I'm missing something that's pertinent. Because to, we're talking about the Panchen Lama not necessarily only because May 14 is his uh, recognition date, but also the TPSA as well as the previous Tibetan Policy Act referred to the issue of the Panchen Lama as integral part of the Tibetan issue. And the Tibetan associations throughout the uh, country here have played a very uh, active role in uh, highlighting the case of the Panchen Lama because that is again uh, part of uh, the legislation that they, uh, we are talking about today. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it also remains shocking to me that the Panchen Lama would uh, only be 31 right now, I believe. So he'd still be a very young man and still has a long life ahead of him where he could serve his people if the Chinese government allows him to return to them. So again, we continue to hope and call for that. Uh, Mateo, you talked about this a little bit already, but before coming to ICT, you served in the Italian parliament. You were elected to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe Parliamentary Assembly, and you helped supervise elections in Serbia, Belarus, and Georgia. So you have a lot of different experience in Europe working on democratic issues and human rights issues. Can you talk a little bit about how the Tibetan issue compares to some of these other issues that you've worked on? And can you also give people watching and people who might be listening to this later an idea of what they can do to take part in the Tibetan movement and help the Tibetan people? Yeah, um, as I mentioned before, I mean, working on Tibet has been on my path, you know, for, for quite some time, actually, with my, you know, political party in Italy. Uh, was connected also to, to a couple of NGOs, um, No Peace Without Justice and the Transnational Radical Party. Uh, we have been working on Tibet as part of a larger um, agenda, which is to you know support and create you know support create and strengthen international institutions. You know one such institutions, for example, has been uh, the International Criminal Court, which was established by uh, you know dozens of tens of countries to try to have uh, uh, some oversight on what national governments can do to their own citizens and to make sure that you know, serious crimes like crimes against humanity, war crimes or genocide would not be repeated again. We know that this is not enough. And so working on Tibet has been always on, 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 this, uh, on this horizon, you know, to try to prevent tragedies to, to affect people. But what I feel um, it's even more important today for me, as you know, as a secular person, uh, not particularly religious all my life, I found in Tibetan teachings, in Tibetan culture, and naturally in particular in the teachings of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, something very, very inspiring, and something that can speak to well beyond the Tibetan people or Tibetan Buddhists, because he's offering, um, he's offering you know, uh, words of wisdom and what he calls secular ethics that are really needed 
uh, for people to learn how to live together uh, in a world which doesn't learn from his past, doesn't learn from history, because we know that every, you know, 25, 30, 40 years, we have a new generation coming and every generation needs to be educated, needs to learn. We, we are not born knowing what happened before us. Uh, and so I find uh, that what, what His Holiness has been able to do to bring uh, to the world uh, the teachings and the wisdom of, you know, of Tibetan traditions and culture as something to offer, uh, as I said, well beyond, uh, well beyond Tibet. And uh, I think that that is why working for ICT, and I think all of us who are watching this, you know, can do something about this to try. And what, what is the goal? The goal is to try to preserve this culture, these uh, teachings, and that they are not crushed. They are not, you know, diluted. They are not completely uh, made, made, you know, meaningless by the Chinese government as they continue to try to do in Tibet, where now maybe they do not destroy completely monasteries, although we have seen that they have, you know, uh, you know, tore down big parts of, you know, uh, very important monastic institutions like Larungar or others. Maybe they allow them to operate, but they cannot operate freely. You know, the monks cannot have the exchanges, the, 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 the vibrancy that, which is needed uh, for, you know, uh, a culture to, to survive, to have freedom, to criticize, you know, the government is part of, you know, cultural production, you know, uh, whether in theater, whether in other aspects of society is always to be able to criticize the government. And actually American society with all the problems that we see, I think it's still a great example because it's all about criticizing the government, you know, making sure that, you know, those who are ruling are held accountable. And this is a big, uh, uh, you know, it, it is a big lesson. So uh, I think for those who appreciate, you know, what, what His Holiness has done, what the Tibetan people, but also with other great teachers, you know, we don't want to just talk about His Holiness. Uh, and what you know, Tibetan cultures have been able to, or could be able to offer to the world, have a chance to to weigh in, have a chance to make a difference. And I am very proud to be part of ICT, who for 30 years has championed this. Um, uh, you know, the the previous piece of legislation that you know Buchum mentioned, the Tibetan Policy Act, the, the the versions that we're now trying to update, was passed in 2002. And that, you know, had an impact, you know, uh, right at the time under the Bush presidency, some form, you know, actually the, a formal dialogue between the Chinese side and the Dalai Lama representative started. So there is, you know, a chance to have an influence. And now we have an opportunity for another, uh, you know, legislative initiative after uh, the one that we passed uh, um, at the end of 2018. Uh, so people can join, you know, they can join ICT, they can join other Tibet super groups. Uh, Butchum Buch mentioned the Tibetan communities in the U.S. who are really stepping up to the plate and are ma playing a major role in uh, making this a domestic issue. Uh, we have seen uh, Tenzin Dorji, and actually I want to mention that today we had him last week. Today he's, uh, it's uh, his last day as a commissioner uh, that was uh, you know, appointed by Speaker Pelosi um, uh, to the Commission for International Religious Freedom. He was the first Tibetan American to you know, to be in that role, and he has performed in a in a in a in a very gracious and effective way, uh, and really has made an impact. And I think has also contributed to to get people understand how Tibetans can you know work and, and, and make a difference. And so, um, as I mentioned, we had scheduled for today the Center for Relations Committee meeting on the Tibetan Policy and Support Act. Now this has been postponed, possibly, you know, very soon. We'll keep you posted. Continue to stay tuned here to learn more about this. But in the meantime, if you are resident in the United States, you can go to safetybet.org slash TPSA dash Senate, right? I got it right. Uh, I repeat it, safetybet.org slash TPSA dash Senate. And there you can sign a petition to your senators. Uh, you know, every every citizen in the United States has two senators, and you can directly send them an email and ask them to co-sponsor and support the Tibetan Policy and Support Act. Uh, there have been already many thousands of people who have done that, uh, but we need to continue to make this grow because this is part of 
it's simply a reflection of the appreciations of you know American society uh, to to move this forward. But beyond that, and I don't want to go too long, but beyond that, we are working with our European offices very closely in Germany, in Berlin, in Amsterdam, in Brussels, uh, to make sure that similar initiatives are taken also by parliaments and governments in those countries. And actually, I'm happy to report that we have seen already some good progress. For example, with the introduction of a similar bill uh, to the one that we passed last year on access to Tibet in the UK. Uh, the European Parliament has also adopted very strong language uh, in the previous Parliament. Now uh, there's a new Parliament and they are working on it. Um, but also on the question of the succession of His Holiness. Uh, some members of Parliament who have been working with, they have questioned the government in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in Germany, also the European Commission, and there were positive replies by those governments saying and putting it on paper now as the former position that it's up only to Tibetan Buddhists to determine the future of the selection uh, of a future Dalai Lama. Uh, so these, these things have an impact. And actually, people may think, oh, China is so powerful, what can we do? A petition is not enough. Uh, I think we need to continue to have a vision, you know, that you know, things can change and things can only change if people take action. And also, and when people take action, governments respond. And when governments respond, that would be something that China will take into consideration when they have to make their own decisions. So don't think that not, you know that everything is nothing is ever lost. Things can always change for the better. And I think uh, at ICT we are naturally optimists, you know, because we're working on a very difficult issue. But we believe that there is hope for everybody. Uh, to be part of a positive change that can affect Tibet, uh, China, but in the end, uh, whole, uh, the whole humanity. So thank you for allowing me to, to share these uh, thoughts today. And back to you, Ashwin. Thank you for that, Matteo. And uh, you mentioned the website that people can go to uh, in order to sign our petition. And uh, I know that we are going to try to show this on the screen here. And uh, I will ask everybody watching from home to please be patient because I'm not entirely certain how to do this. So we're going to try it here. Um, so I'm going to try to share my screen and show folks uh, how they can go to this website. Okay, uh, hopefully you are seeing my screen. Um, you need to go to, as Matteo mentioned, the website is safetibet.org slash TPSA dash Senate. And if you go there, uh, you will see this petition. Hopefully you are seeing this uh, on your screen here. Uh, you'll see a petition where you can just fill in your information and it will send a message to your two senators to let them know that you want them to sign on to and support the Tibetan Policy and Support Act. We also have a pretty cool video here of the House hearing where the House of Representatives passed the uh, Tibetan Policy of Support Act. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and many, many other members of Congress including uh, Representative Jim McGovern, who introduced the bill in the House, uh, all get a chance to speak in, up in favor, of, speak in favor of this bill, and talk about why it's so important. So I encourage you to check that out if you get a chance. So once again, it's SaveTibet.org/tpsa-senate. So please go there and please fill out these petitions and send them to your senators. So with that, I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen here. And uh, so again, hopefully everybody saw that clearly, but. Uh, moving on, we are starting to get some questions and comments on Facebook and uh, through our email. So I want to share now a uh, comment that we're getting. Uh, first of all, let me just remind folks, if you are interested in asking a question for either Mateo or Buchung, please email your question to comments at safetibet.org or post your question in the comment section of the live stream on our Facebook page. So please do that, and we'll try to get to your questions here before the hour is up. Uh, here I have something that's kind of more of a comment, but I want to share this with you guys. Uh, this is from somebody on Facebook named John Young Tupton, and he says, Thank you guys for taking up and supporting the Tibetan issue. It is very deserving of support as being a world community, very humble and respectful community. The world needs at this critical time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Tibet spirituality could provide help to lots of people around the world regarding the mental stress they're suffering right now. Puchung, uh, I know that you are obviously not a uh, religious leader yourself, but 
But as a member of the Tibetan community and uh, as somebody who is deeply involved with that culture, is there anything you can share about how Tibetan culture can help people as they're dealing with the emotional stress and all the challenges of this pandemic uh, that we are all going through right now? I frankly don't claim to have any knowledge to be able to give uh, advice to people. I myself am in need of advice at this point of time when the whole we're having this global crisis. But what uh, we learn from His Holiness the Dalai Lama through his uh, now, I think, three uh, statements on uh, the issue of uh, attitude, our approach towards uh, a crisis like this. Uh, coronavirus pandemic or any other uh, global crisis. It's important for us to put that in perspective and to see how we can uh, uh, look at the positive aspect of things. Because after all, if there's no solution, as His Holiness reminded us in his, I think his first statement, if there's no solution, then there is no use worrying. That's what he says. And that's very, uh, I think down to earth practical because sometimes, particularly in the Western societies, uh, people continue to feel depressed even though they know that there's no solution. So rather than feeling depressed, if you know that something is not going to change, be well uh, 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 that we try to see what is the best, uh, the silver lining in this and how we can uh, sort of increase that silver lining to ultimately be the part of your total mindset. That is what I at least try to do during this period. Thank you, Buchang. Uh, as I mentioned before, I always uh, love that piece of advice from His Holiness, and it's one of the things that really got me involved with Tibet in the first place. If you're worried about some great cause of suffering, you should ask yourself if there's anything you can do about it. If there is something you can do, then there's no, re no reason to worry. If there's nothing you can do, then there's also no reason to worry. Worrying is not going to help the situation one way or another. So I think that's great advice for people to hear right now. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we are also getting some comments about the situation in Europe. So let me first read from Jane Blechstein on Facebook. I live in Europe and would like to see Europe give more support for the Tibetan people. And uh, we also have a comment from uh, somebody named Tenzin Yonten Zopa Mahakaruna, at least that's their name on Facebook. Uh, how can we make the Italian government, especially the new young foreign minister, realize the long-term danger of working with the Chinese regime of Xi Jinping? Matteo, as uh, somebody who served in the Italian parliament and uh, as somebody who has uh, been involved in European politics, can you talk a little bit about kind of what work we are doing in Europe and what you would like to see European countries do in order to help the Tibetan people? Yeah, let me also just remind that uh, to Saturday morning, which would be actually Friday night or Saturday, Saturday early morning in Europe, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama will give uh, teachings uh, which have been requested by you know many people and groups in the world, and they will be live. Uh, I think you can find you can all find information on dalailama.com, and uh, he will give uh, you know some specific teachings. But he has also been asked to give some advice on how people can face this uh, situation you know uh, caused by the pandemic. So I think that will be also something that we are all look, at least myself you know I'm gonna. Look forward to that, and I just want to uh, remind people that there is this opportunity. So, uh, yeah, being from Europe, I, I share uh, the feelings of you know the first uh, um, comment, and uh, being in Italian, I'm quite worried about the second comment myself. Um, and so, I think you know, in Europe, uh, we are facing a number of challenges politically. Um, and I think there are many reasons, but I would sum it up that, you know, one big challenge that we are having is that European political project to build uh, a, a united Europe uh, with, uh, you know, common uh, policies, institutions based uh, as the founders of the European Union wanted to see it, uh, more or less like a federal system, is not really making progress. Actually, there has been over the last few years a pushback against that political project with the resurgence of some populist um, parties and, uh, and attitudes, which we have seen also in the United States, frankly, but is taking place um, in a quite widespread way also in Europe. And so without that uh, structural, uh, you know, political uh, approach, uh, it's difficult for Europe to take strong positions on any international issue, not only on Tibet. Actually, if you look 
uh, at the so-called European foreign policy, uh, frankly, is, is very weak, or at least is not perceived as strong as there is a resurgence of nationalism and uh, the idea that you should not you know, give too much power uh, to European institutions. So that, I think, is a, is a challenge that we are all uh, facing in Europe and uh, is going to have an impact on the future of the world. Uh, because unless Europe becomes, uh, you know, a very, you know, important player in the, you know, geopolitical dynamic between the United States and China, it's not going to be easy to try to solve some of the challenges that we have, you know, from climate change to uh, global crises like uh, uh, the pandemic that we're living at now, or uh, human rights, you know, situations like the one in Tibet. Uh, what is comforting to me is that, you know, at the people's level, you know, the popular support for the Tibetan cause and his is the Dalai Lama is still very strong also in Europe. So I think there are, even in this context, there are opportunities to engage with members of parliament who are usually supportive, with other groups, journalists, civil society, public opinion to make the governments realize that dealing with China is an issue that cannot be kept outside of the political conversation or the political discussion. And that's the problem that is happening now in Italy with the, with the current foreign minister, but it's based, it's based on a trend which has been going on, frankly, also for a number of years, in which the Italian government has tried to, uh, to seek you know, uh, econo economic advantages in the relationship with China, which is something which is good and positive, and nobody you know, is against that, but has done that at the expense of you know, the values on which our democracy is founded. And the problem with the current foreign minister is that their political culture of that party is not linked in, in, to any of the uh, political family in Europe, neither the socialist, the liberal, the conservative, the Christian Democrat is, uh, you, know, it's, uh, you know, people define it as a populist movement. Um, so basically, when you don't have a solid political culture, what happens often is that you know, the, the short-term interests prevail. And now they have seen in China an opportunity you know, to help somehow uh, the Italian government to cash in some support, uh, but it's a very short-sighted approach. Uh, first of all, because you know, not much money has come, almost uh, nothing. But most importantly, because any, if you have this kind of approach with China, uh, which is an unprincipled approach, China is going to take advantage of that because they are going to link their economic support to political conditions. So it's not now, you know, there used to be before what they called, uh, you know, uh, human rights clause that democratic governments would put with the other, you know, when giving um, aid, economic aid or humanitarian assistance to make sure that these governments would get their economic support, but at the same time they had to respect human rights and democracy, which is the right approach. Actually, now is the opposite. China is allowing people to go and do business, or in theory, they're allowed to do that. We know that there are more restrictions in any case, but they put conditions on them to be able to do that. So you don't have to talk to about Taiwan. You don't have to talk about Tibet. You don't have to talk about Xinjiang. So this is very dangerous. And so uh, I think there is some awareness now, uh, especially lately in Italy, because of uh, some of the moves made by the foreign minister, so the, 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 there's, there's an open debate. But uh, my hope is that, you know, um, also Europe and the United States are able to step in and show that, you know, there are alternative models of development that should be pursued that are not based on um, dictatorship like in China. All right, thank you, Matteo. It's uh, very valuable to have your perspective as somebody who did work in the Italian government and who really has his finger on the pulse of what's uh, happening in Europe. We should say once again that ICT has offices uh, not only here in Washington, D.C., but also in Amsterdam, Berlin, and Brussels. So we are really working to advocate for Tibet on both sides of the Atlantic, and that's something that we will continue to do. Uh, I have a few more questions and comments here. First of all, I want to read a comment from someone named Sean Washington on Facebook. This comment says, I can't understand why the Chinese government will not give powers back to Tibet. China needs to show some respect. It seems to me there is a lack of common decency. 
I think we will just say that we all certainly agree with that. And uh, we do believe there's a lack of, of decency and lack of human rights there. And we are certainly hopeful that genuine autonomy can someday return to Tibet. Uh, I want to move now to a question from uh, Bob McCoy, also on Facebook. Uh, Bob asks, can you talk a little bit about the developments of the Chinese pavilions being built directly in front of the Jokang Temple in Lhasa, which is something that we talked about on ITT's website recently. And I just want to add that Bob McCoy says that he visited the Jokang in 2018 in response to one of our previous reports about the Chinese government making additions to that historic temple. Uh, Buchong, I wonder if that is a question that you might be able to respond to. Yeah, well, uh, the pavilions on a historical uh, pillar right in front of the Chokang in Lhasa. Uh, there are two aspects of the issue. One is the factual uh, information about developments. Uh, those of you who have read our report in the past week or so would know that uh, uh, this issue came to light when the Tibetan writer who, who is based in uh, China, uh, in Beijing, uh, Tring Wasil, she uh, put a posting about that on her social media account as well as uh, on Radio Free Asia Chinese, in which she talked about uh, having seen uh, people having seen these pavilions after the Chinese partially reopened the circumambulation route around the Chokang and uh, some photos appeared. And that showed that uh, two Chinese style pavilions were being uh, constructed there. Uh, from a spiritual perspective, this is something that the Tibetan Buddhists would not like. Uh, particularly those inside Tibet, although they would not have the ability to be able to express their feelings that way. Uh, but Chokang is a very sacred place for the Tibetan Buddhists. And as it is, people, uh, since Bob has been to Chokang, he would know that the space around it is crowded. And uh, uh, where the pillar is also is right in front of the Chokang. I myself have been there, so I know uh, uh, what it is. And uh, that sort of uh, is the place where the Tibetan pilgrims congregate the most. And having such a structure there uh, affects the Tibetan people's uh, spiritual practice. On top of that, if you look at it just from the aesthetic historical uh, uh, site preservation aspect of it, UNESCO had recognized Chokang as a World Heritage Site in 2000. And since then, uh, it has come under its uh, uh, oversight so that Anything the Chinese government does which affects the historical uh, aspect of the structure has to be uh, reported to UNESCO and UNESCO should be approving it. So what we have done, and that's the other aspect of the issue that I uh, mentioned, is that we, uh, w when we came to know about this issue, we first of all reported about it on our website and uh, secondly, our uh, offices in Europe, which takes care of our United Nations initiatives, wrote to UNESCO asking them for information about it because ever since uh, not just the Chokang, the Potala, and the Nobelinka, all of these are inscribed under the same UNESCO World Heritage List. And uh, China has to report regularly to UNESCO about uh, uh, upkeeps and about anything that affects these areas. And we would certainly want to know what the UNESCO has uh, in terms of information from China about this structure, which both from the aesthetic perspective and the spiritual perspective is against Tibetan people's tradition. Thank you, Buchang. It's certainly heartbreaking to see what the Chinese government is doing to this uh, important site that is sacred to so many believers. And uh, I know that uh, we at ICT will obviously continue to monitor what's happening there and we will continue to monitor for this World Heritage Site to receive the protection that it deserves. So thank you for Actually, sharing uh, that. Sorry for doing this, but I think, uh, again, uh, there are people, although, and that's not the factual aspect, of people who feel that the Chinese government wanting to construct such Chinese looking uh, pavilions on top of the historical pillar, yet not just because they want to protect that pillar. That pillar is a very historical, uh, uh, historically significant pillar uh, that reflects the Treaty of 18, H21, H22, 
uh, between the then Tibetan ruler and the then Chinese ruler, in which both sides said that they will keep peace with each other, and that uh, a very famous uh, quote is from there that Chinese will be happy in the land of China, Tibetans will be happy in the land of Tibet. So there are some people who feel that China is constructing that pavilion so that uh, people will get less opportunity to know what that pillar is really about. No, th thank you for sharing that. That's an important piece of historical context. So thank you for adding that, Bu Zhang. Uh, we are running low on time and uh, we have one more question here. I think this is a pretty easy one. And uh, this is for you, Mateo. This comes from Tenzin Chemi on Facebook. And the question is, uh, why is Tenzin Dorji leaving his position on user? So can you talk a little bit about uh, what's happening there? Uh, yeah. Um... You know, the reason is uh, because he's ending his uh, second term uh, as a commissioner. Uh, so each commissioner can be appointed for initially for one term, which lasts two years. And uh, for Tenzin Dorji, that happened in 2016. Then he was reappointed again by Speaker Pelosi in uh, 2018 for two years. And now, actually today, May 14, 2020, is the last day. I think at 12 o'clock, he told me. So it's just one, uh, a couple of hours ago. <laughs> He's no longer a, a commissioner. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the reason, yeah. All right, well, thank you for that, Matteo. And uh, of course, we all once again thank Professor Dorji for his uh, great years of service uh, on USERF and his commitment to religious freedom and to the people of Tibet. Uh, with that, we are just about out of time here. So I want to thank uh, Matteo and Buchung once again for that excellent conversation. And I would also like to thank all of you who are watching and listening from home. We know that this is a difficult time for us all, but we hope that this conversation motivated you to take positive action for Tibet. As this conversation showed, if we all work together, we can make a difference for the Tibetan people. Next week, we will be back with another episode of Tibet Talks. If you'd like to learn more about this series, please go to savetibet.org slash live to learn about our upcoming episodes. And if you'd like to get involved in the work we do, please visit savetibet.org slash report. We hope to see you next week. Thank you once again for watching. And to paraphrase Professor Tenzin Dorji, our first speaker on Tibet Talks, stay safe, stay well, and stay active. Thank you.